So it was all about selecting the right retaining walls for the right situations. And unfortunately, there is many different types that we have to choose from. So how can we know which is the right ones? So it's important that you know the benefits and drawbacks of each of them to make sure you can make that critical design consideration of choosing the right retaining wall. My name is Brendan, your structural engineer. Now let's get into it. Although retaining walls come in many different forms, they all serve the same goal. Firstly, they need to resist the lateral pressures of soil, but in some situations, they also need to resist any lateral pressures that may be applied above them from such things as buildings that may be above there applying pressure on the wall. If you've got traffic or pedestrians, they can also apply additional load. Or if there's a big slope, as when you're thinking about that slope, there's more soil that the retaining wall needs to restrain. These are all things that we need to consider when selecting the different types of retaining walls that we have available to you. One of the most easiest to build and cheapest retaining walls that you have available is called a sleeper and post retaining wall system. So these are typically found in more your residential areas and are only limited to about one or two meters in height and typically can't restrain any buildings that may be above them. The sleepers in between them potentially have two forms. They can either be a timber retaining wall. So you've got those timber sleepers that are suitable for in-ground use, or they could be also concrete, which is becoming more and more common today. And the posts are typically made up of universal column sections that are cast into the ground with board piers and then typically at about a 2.4 meter spacing. Now, what governs the spacing of the posts is the amount of soil that's retaining behind it and also that how far those sleepers can span. Other things you may need to consider in a sleeper and post system is how long it needs to survive. So what is the design life of the structure that you're looking at? As typically that exposed steel won't have an extended lifetime. So you will potentially need to put additional corrosion protection, but this steel Still limits the lifespan of this retaining wall system. To hold back the pressure of soil requires you to click that like button. Not only does it help me out, but it also allows to get these episodes out to more people. The next type of retaining wall is those large gravity retaining walls. So the way they resist the lateral pressures of soil is just through bulk mass. So typically they need a large area to allow them to be effective. Now there's many different types of materials that they can be built from. So they can be built from concrete, stone, masonry, and they can also serve many different forms from those crib walls, gabion walls. Now gabions are basically those big rock baskets that you may see on the side of roads, or sometimes they're just that mass concrete behind them. Now, typically you can go up to about four meters for this type of retaining wall is limited by the amount of mass that you can stack up behind it. So the higher you need to go, the bigger the base will need to be. But they can also be susceptible to those global movements. So you can have a big slip plane that can cause the whole thing to overturn. So you need to be carefully consider both those local effects and those global effects when designing this type of retaining wall. Obviously the biggest drawback of using this type of retaining wall is the area that they need to hold back the soil. Especially the higher you go, the bigger the base will be. So the bigger the area that the retaining wall needs to take up. Another really common type of retaining wall system is your cantilever retaining wall. And these can be seen across a variety of systems from your commercial, residential, and all the way to your backyard constructions. And they typically top out between five to six meters. As any larger, they become really impractical. There's normally two components to a cantilever retaining wall. You'll have your footing that's doing the bulk of the work. And typically this is made out of concrete. And then you also have the vertical element, which is known as the stem. And there's a variety of materials that you can choose from, from concrete, precast masonry. There's also two ways that these type of retaining walls can be built. So you can either build the footing into the heel side, which means the soil is backed up behind it. This is typically the more efficient way, but sometimes you'll see because of limitations on site, they'll extend out the other way, which is the toe side, which is a lot less efficient. Now, the reason behind the lack of efficiency is if you have a look at the toe option, you've got the soil in behind it. So when that retaining wall starts to try and roll over, it has the soil behind it to hold it back. Then no another major problem with this type of retaining wall system is the fact that you don't have a lot of mass, so it can be susceptible to sliding. And if you have a system that you've checked and it has that sliding problem, you can build a little key in underneath the footing that allows you to key into more soil to help you resist those lateral soil pressures. These cantilever systems can also be built into buildings and actually become a lot more efficient. This is known as a prop cantilever wall. Typically, you will have the footing on the toe side, making it less efficient, but as you build up your retaining wall, it'll be tied into the slab over. What this allows you to do is have a support at the top and support at the bottom. Because when the soil pressure is pushed on the top, it will go into the diaphragm and the slab and go to the side walls that are more effective in their strong direction. So this allows for a lot more efficient design. The next type of retaining wall system is your embedded wall system. And these come in a variety of different types from a diaphragm wall to a sheet metal retaining system to piles. One of the biggest benefits of using this type of system is the fact that you can build it without needing to 
spatter back the slope behind it as you can build it in a series of stages. The diaphragm wall is as it sounds. Essentially, it's a continuous wall where you need to retain the soil. They essentially build it in a series of stages and you can make it quite thick. So it's really good if you need to restrain a lot of water. So you're building near a river or the beach. The sheep wall system can't go as high or is not as effective as the diaphragm system, but it's a little bit easier to build. Essentially, they get a series of metal sheets that they press into the ground to allow you to either permanently or temporarily restrain back the soil. And then you can build a concrete wall in front of it. So it allows you to build quite quickly and easily as all you need to do, press down these sheets into the ground, typically in hammering motion. So you may have vibrations propagating through the soil to the adjacent structures near you. The other system that we also talked about was the pyro retention system. Now these come in two forms and it's typically one of the most common as it's one of the easiest to build, especially to your great depths. So you either have a contiguous pile system or a pile and shotcrete wall system. So what the contiguous pile of the system is, you have a hard and a soft pile. So you have your hard pile that does all the work and your soft pile that helps restrain that soil. So if you've got a really coarse material that can't allow you to excavate at all, you'll potentially need to go down the contiguous pile system. So when you build the contiguous pile system, you drill a series of piles. Now, those piles, first up, won't have any reinforcement in them and will typically have a weak mix. You then drill in your hard piles, keying into those weak piles. So you're drilling through those weak piles and drilling in the main restraining system, which is your strong piles. Then we come to the, one of the most common retaining wall systems, which is the pile, shotcrete wall, and capping beam. Now the capping beam is here to allow for tolerances where the pile is doing the main retention and the shotcrete wall is just spanning between the piles. And this would typically be used in a situation where the soil can arch between the pile systems temporarily. As the soil can arch between these piles, you can dig down your retaining wall after drilling the piles in and you can build that shotcrete wall in between the piles after the excavation is complete. The piled or the diaphragm wall systems are not really limited by how deep you can go down. Because in their final state, you'll typically have a series of slabs in between them, only needing them to span between floor to floor. When you're constructing it, there are special considerations that you need to have. As you don't have those slabs in yet, as you're building down, you potentially may need some soil anchors at the same given locations to make sure that you don't overload the piles for the short term solution. Now, if you don't have those temporary walls in between them and they need to cantilever out of the ground, you will be limited to height. So as opposed to the ones that we just talked about before, where you have a series of slabs helping restrain back that soil, if you go to your more traditional cantilever method, you can only really cantilever your diaphragms or your board piers up to about four to five meters. But when you put those temporary floor structures in or other back propping measures, you can go to whatever depth you need to. Also similar to either the diaphragm wall or the pilot system, you can't build hard up against the boundary as you have this big machinery that needs to go up to allow you to excavate the retaining wall system. And typically you can't go any closer to about 100 millimeters from the boundary. At which point, as the construction of piles is, has a tolerance to it, you need to put a capping beam on top of your pile system to make up the difference. So a capping beam essentially spans between the piles to not only carry the vertical load between them, but also make up the difference between the tolerance that you have in construction. If there are any different types of retaining wall systems that I've missed, please comment below. And without the support of my Patreons listed here, these type of episodes would not be possible. And as always, stay safe, keep learning, and I'll see you next week. Bye.